the uh, first Sunday of Lent. You have been here in Salt Lake City. You have an extension of Elbow Nevada here. The epistle for the first Sunday of Lent is taken from the second epistle of St. Paul to Corinthians chapter 6. Brethren, we exhort you that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he saith, in an acceptable time have I heard thee, in the day of salvation have I helped thee. Behold, now is the acceptable time, behold, now is the day of salvation. Give we no offense to any man, that our ministry be not blamed. But in all things let us exhibit ourselves as the ministers of Christ, as ministers of God, in much patience, in tribulation, in necessities, in distresses, in stripes, in prisons, in seditions, in labors, in watchings, in fastings, in chastity, in knowledge, in long suffering, in sweetness, in the Holy Ghost, in charity, unfeigned, in the word of truth, in the power of God, by the armor of justice on the right hand and on the left, by honor and dishonor, by evil report and good report, as deceivers and yet true, as unknown and yet known, as dying and behold we live, as chastised and not killed, as sorrowfully and always rejoicing, as needy and enriching many, as having nothing and possessing all things. And then the Gospel, saying that according to St. Ma Ma Matthew chapter 4. At that time Jesus was led by the Spirit of the desert to be tempted by the devil. And when he had fasted forty days and forty nights, afterwards he was hungry. And the tempter coming said to him, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Who answered and said, It is written, Not in bread alone doth man live, but in every word that proceedeth from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him up into the holy city, and set him upon the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If thou be the Son of God, cast thyself down. For it is written, that he hath given his angels charge over thee, and in their hands they shall bear thee up lest perhaps thou dash thy foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, It is written again, Thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. Again the devil took him up into a very high mountain, and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and the glory of them, and said to him, All these will I give thee, if falling down thou wilt adore me. Then Jesus saith to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, The Lord thy God shalt thou adore, and him only shalt thou serve. And the devil left him, and behold, the angels came and ministered to him. Those were the words of today's Holy Gospel. Hello, my Father, Son, Holy Ghost, Amen. We begin the sacred season of Lent. Thirty-six days of fast remain between now and Easter Sunday, which Saint Gregory the Great, Saint Augustine, called the tithing of the year. We give a special way to special tithing of the year. And today a few considerations on temptation, and particularly the temptation of the conservative. The temptation of the priest in the Society of St. Pius X who knows we're not going in the right direction, but who wants to be a good priest. The temptation of the conservative, now a subtle priest, who realizes that uh, he's, he's, he's on the path towards the truth, trying to learn it, but he's afraid to go all the way, doesn't know exactly what to do. And these are experiencing temptations. But there are three levels of temptation, says uh, St. Thomas, uh, uh, says St. Gregory the Great in his sermon today on the temptation of Christ. He says the first, first level of temptation is a suggest, suggestion. The second level is the delectation or the feeling of pleasure. And the third is consent. So in every temptation, there are these three stages. And the first stage equals the suggestion of the temptation. Now, and again, normally the temptation is going to be a temptation of anger, temptation of gluttony, a temptation of impurity, a temptation of greed, a temptation of pride, uh, the seven classical temptations of the seven capital sins. And each of these temptations, when we receive them, we're very aware that we're being tempted. But the temptation, first of all, is a suggestion. Suggestion to get angry, or to be greedy, or to be proud, or to be the temptation of the flesh, or so on. And, and then the second stage is when the temptation increases and there is a feeling of the temptation. And St. Augustine points, or rather St. Gregory the Great, the Pope, points out, there is no sin in the feeling. 
Because sin consists in the will. Sin consists in the heart. It doesn't consist in a feeling. So that when there is a feeling of anger, one has not yet committed the sin of anger. When there's a feeling of pride, a feeling of impurity, a feeling of gluttony, a feeling of whatever the sin might be, of greed and, and so on, when there's a feeling of these sins, the feeling does not constitute the sin. So that the and that uh, there is a feeling, and then they were the, uh, uh, to drive towards the direction of the sin, and the sin consists only in the third level, which is when we consent to the sin, we consent to the anger, we consent to the pride, and so on. This sin is also never a mortal sin unless there is a full consent. So if there's a partial consent, it's a venial sin. If it's a full consent to a lesser matter, it's also a venial sin. But to be a mortal sin. That there be a full consent in a serious matter. That we know that it's a serious matter and that we have a full consent to it. Partial consent would be venial sin or an imperfection, depending on how little the consent is. And then, but the but the feeling itself is not where the sin is. Now there are some temptations which the fathers which the fathers tell us called the temptation under the appearance of good. And these temptations, the devil tries to deceive. But in order for these temptations to be temptations, we have to know that there's something wrong. So they have a, if we're being tempted to, for instance, be obedient, be tempted to be obedient, because the superior told me I must celebrate the new mass. The superior told me I must burn down the church. The superior told me I must do some evil thing that I know I shouldn't do. But the superior told me, and so I think, well, I'm under obedience. I'm obliged to be obedient to my commanding officer. My an officer told me to shoot the people of this village. Maybe they're all murderers. Maybe they all have it come to them. Maybe, maybe they're not innocent. I'm not the judge of the situation about these women and children. I'm being commanded by my, my military commander officer to shoot these people. And that's what I have to do. I have to be obedient. I wouldn't normally do it. But it's not my responsibility because I'm a soldier and I have to be obedient. One can be tempted to be obedient. And St. Thomas would point out that the obedience... It's never the sin. The obedience is not the sin. I am obliged to be obedient to my superiors. The army of the soldier is obliged to be superior to obedient to his commanding officer. The priest is obliged to be obedient to his bishop or to his uh, religious superior. The seminarian is obliged to be, be obedient to the rector. The child is obliged to be obedient to the father. The employee is obliged to be obedient to the employer. All citizens are obliged to be obedient to the king, or to the president, or to the mayor, or to the police officer. So it is never ever bad to obey them. That's never the problem. The problem is, when the superior says, I command you, I am your material, I am your, I am your general, and I am telling you, under obedience, you're obliged to shoot this innocent child in a village. To be obedient is not a problem, but to shoot the child is murder. And you're being told to shoot the child. And when the, when the superior tells you to shoot the child, when the, when the commanding officer tells you to shoot the child, he is not given an act of orders, because all orders must come from God and must be in conformity to God. He's simply making an evil suggestion under the guise of a command. He's not really, he has no power to command you to do evil. And therefore, you have no power to obey him. If a man comes down the street and tells you, I want you to murder your wife. You know, I command you to murder your wife. Well, he commanded me to murder my wife, so I murdered my wife. No, you, you, you simply, he said the word command, but he's a simply beggar you met in the streets. He has no authority to command you. And neither does the king have authority to command you to do something evil. It's not a command. Therefore, you can't obey, nor can you disobey. You can't obey a wicked command, and you can't disobey a wicked command. Obedience is always a good thing. So when the commander tells me, you must do this evil act, you must murder this innocent child, you, uh, you must say, no, we are going to have such commands given to us. The law is going to command you for your health and safety. You are obliged to take a vaccine. For your health and safety, you are obliged to take a vaccine, which is made from aborted baby, and which in fact is not even a vaccine, but it is a biological weapon and a poison that's going to cause harm, and it's not a medicine. But you're going to be obliged to take an abor aborted baby, and, or and if you don't do it, you will be guilty of a crime. 
This obligation does not exist. A commander cannot make me do something which is evil. But there can be a temptation under the appearance of good. And this temptation in the appearance of good is truly called a temptation because even though we think we're doing something good, we know we're not. You can think you're doing something good and at the same time know you're not. This was what causes a guilty conscience. I don't, you know, that many people say, well, I'm living with my second wife, living with my second husband. Uh, you know, I'm, a, I'm a, a, a following the obedience to my bishop. The bishop told me to say the new mass. The bishop told me to do these things. But the bishop allowed me to say the Latin mass. And I, I'm trying to be holy with my second wife. My first wife, she was horrible. But the second wife, I'm trying to be very holy with her. And the, we're trying to live according to the law of God. It's just that she's not the wife. And so you say, well, you're being very good with the second wife. Well, you can't be good with the second wife because she's not a wife. She's not a wife. Therefore, you can't have wife, the obligations of wife with her. And then you have the temptation, though. I must continue in good with this person that is not living according to the law of God. I'm going to, I'm going to do something that's against the law of God, believing that it is the law of God. At the end of the world, St. Thomas, as our Lord Jesus Christ says, there will be infinite numbers of these temptations. The time will come when they shall kill you, thinking they do a service to God. But in fact, they will be tempted. They will think they're doing a service to God, but they will know there's something wrong. Now, what is the temptation? So in the case of modern priests and tradition, and modern priests of the Society of Pius X, they are being told, well, you have to obey your superior, and that's a very good thing to obey your superior. You have to uh, do your job in your parish. That's a good thing to do your job in your parish. But you have to be quiet about the official proclamations of the society, such as the one our proclamation most recently, that it's moral to take the vaccines in the case of in, in dire circumstances, at least. It's moral to take the vaccines. And you shouldn't warn the people that these vaccines are a grave evil, that are a grave harm, but are causing grave harm. You have to follow the policy of the, of the society. And you have to make sure that if you're going to tell people about vaccines being bad, you can do that privately. You can do that secretly. And so thereby help people. But you can't do it publicly from the pulpit. You cannot speak publicly from the pulpit about the grave evils of uh, making our deal with Rome. The proclamation, the Declaration of 2012, which is a declaration contrary to the Catholic faith, which our superiors should be completely against. You can't speak against it. Well, I'm not speaking against it because if I do speak against it, I'll be thrown out. And if I'm thrown out, I won't be able to help the people. So what's the temptation? What is the temptation of these priests? There are two temptations. These are the most common temptations for people that are trying to be good in any bad world. So if you're in a, if you're in a bad army, if you're in a bad uh, religious organization, if you're in a bad uh, you know, a, a diocese, or you're in a bad or a society like the Society of Christ's Tent, which has turned its official position against God, and you and the a priest in a bad diocese. And what we mean by bad diocese is not that it has a wicked bishop that rules it, or a wicked priest that rules the Society of St. Pius X, but that there is a wicked direction and a wicked teaching that in and of itself is contrary to the perennial teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ and harmful to souls and leads souls to perdition. What is the temptation of the conservative priest? The temptation of the good soldier. And the temptation of the conservative priest and good soldier is, in fact, it is the temptation of the world. And this temptation is, if I stand up for the truth, and I really speak against the errors, I will be thrown out. And if I am thrown out, I won't have a house, I won't have a place to stay, I won't have a parish. I don't see how I'll be able to do good work. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to go as close as I can to the truth. I'm going to do as close as I can to the truth, and I'm going to undermine my superiors. So there are two temptations. One temptation is the temptation of saving your home and your place, and that your world and your money and your security is more important than your God. And the second temptation is you are going to fight against the devil by being demonic. We say fight fire with fire, but you know that if there is a fire and you add fire to the fire, all you've got is a bigger fire. 
In order to really fight fire, you have to use something called water, and you have to put out the fire. You can't fight fire with fire. In the case of a house burning down, you fight fire with water. And so it is that we decide we're going to fight the devil by using demonic tactics. And here is a demonic tactic of the conservative priest, which over time turns him into a follower of Satan. The first temptation is a normal one. That is the temptation of the world. That if I go along with my bishop, if I go along with my superior, and try to be as good as I can, even though he doesn't want me to be good, I at least keep my house. I at least keep my position. I at least keep from being despised and destroyed and thrown out by my people, by my superiors, by my brothers. That's a normal temptation of weakness. The second temptation is a demonic temptation. And this temptation is, I will subvert the Society of St. Pius X. I will subvert Rome. I will subvert the diocese. I will subvert the religious order that I belong to. Because there is an evil superior with evil directions, and he's doing evil things. So I will stand in front of him, and I will say, I agree with you. I will say, I follow you. I will not publicly denounce him for his grave errors and teachings and heresies. But I will quietly tell the people that he's wrong. And I will quietly work in my own circles. And I will develop friends. And we will gather together a unit of friends. And one day, there is going to be a new election. And there will be a coup d'etat. And we will throw him out. Use the devil's tactics against the devil. This is called subversion. And it is the essence of the satanic. It is the essential way to be satanic. You will not find this in the lives of the saints. The first temptation is a temptation of frail flesh. The priest is a human being like anyone else. The soldier is a human being like anyone else. And the soldier is afraid of losing his position. He is afraid of being court-martialed. He is afraid of being thrown out. The priest is afraid of being excommunicated. He is afraid of being suspended. He is afraid of losing his house and his home and his security. He is afraid of losing his parish. And he doesn't see good coming from it. This is the fear of the loss of things over the loss of God. This temptation is going to be the principal means by which the Antichrist causes the majority of people throughout the world. We're talking about good people. The evil people will happily take the mark of the peace. But the good people throughout the world at the time of the Antichrist 99% of them, or a great percentage of them, the vast majority of them, will take the mark of the beast. And what is the reason why they will take the mark of the beast? They will take it because if they don't take it, they starve. If they don't take it, they don't survive. And then they will take that mark of the beast, and they will obey in what they know to be a sinful command. But those that are more inclined to be deceived by the devil are going to be the ones who say, I will take this mark of the beast. I will obey my superior. I will smile. I will pretend like I'm his friend. When in fact, I am the friend of tradition. And I'm not the friend of modernism. And I will use my influence to climb inside of the order. And then one day, I will become pope. One day, I will become bishop. One day, I will become superior. And if not myself, I will make sure that one of my friends who's traditional, one of my friends who's conservative, they will also become superiors. This is the essence of the satanic temptation. It is the temptation of greatest pride, the temptation of deceit. And the devil does not, the God does not operate in deceit. The devil operates always in deceit. So hence, there are three ways, one of the priests used to say, there are three ways in which we can treat a command of a superior. One, we can agree, because he's right, my conscience aligns with it, and obey. Two, we can disagree, because he's going against God in a serious way, and disobey, which is not a real disobedience, it's actually true obedience to God. And three, we can disagree, and believe he's wrong, and subvert. And this is the satanic. What happens over time is that these priests who are the conservative priests, these priests who are the ones who are going to be the closest to tradition, who are going to use their power in order to work on the inside to destroy the superior, they become filled with the spirit of Satan. They become the principal instruments of, of the devil to destroy the kingdom of God. Just consider the last 50 years. 
who are the ones who made sure that the traditional movement did not grow and wax strong? They are not the liberals. They are not the Pope Francis's and the Father Skippies of the world. They are the conservative priests, the ones who kept people inside the Novus Ordo Church. Many of them fell for this temptation in their hearts, and they are now burning in hell. Others were deceived, and they didn't fall for this temptation, because there's another possibility. And this is rare, but it happens. And that is, someone who genuinely makes a mistake. There may be some priests who are doing exactly the wrong thing. That is, they are staying in the Novus Ordo. But they believe, before God, in their hearts, that they must be obedient. And they're not worried about losing their house, and losing their church, and losing their comfort. They're ready to lose it if they believe that's what's right before God. And these priests also are being instruments of the devil, but only on the outside, because they are good priests, and they are not subverted, and they are not perverted, and they do not work by way of subversion. They are honest with their superiors. They take the punishments that are given to them. They are stuck inside the Novus Ordo, or stuck inside the Society of St. Pius X, or whatever order that they are in that is not following the law of God. But their hearts are clean, because... They, in their minds, believe they are obliged to this obedience. And the sign that they are honest is they never subvert. They don't subvert. The priests who appear to be very good and who are to fall for that temptation of subversion, these are taken over by the devil. So there is a normal temptation of the conservative. I don't want to lose my house and my home. I don't want to lose my position. I don't want to be thrown out. So I'll toe the line and be as good as I can. And by doing this, they keep many souls from coming to the resistance. They keep many souls from coming to the sizing Christ the 10th in the old days. They keep many souls of coming to the true tradition. They keep many souls in the state of mediocrity and become instruments to lead souls to hell. But there are the worst ones, and these are the ones who appear to be, appear to be better. And these are the ones who use their power. They're inside the society of Pius the 10th. They are inside the orders, and they are going to subvert. That is what they are going to do. Their temptation is to imitate Satan, to destroy Satan, and when they follow this temptation, they become satanic. And they will be the ones who will make sure that the Christ is defeated. Of course, Christ can never be defeated. In as many souls as possible, the devil enters into their hearts. So there are the innocent ones who are making a mistake of judgment, and these are not and don't have a devil in their hearts. They're only making a mistake. These are very few. And then there are the ones who appear to be innocent, but in fact, they are operating in order to do as much good as they can in the society of St. Pius X, in the Novus Ordo, in the fraternity of St. Peter, in the Institute of Christ the King, or whatever such organization they're in that is not following the law of God as it should. And these ones will be taken over by the spirit of Satan, we have to pray for the conversion of these souls because this kind of this kind of taking over is generally never overcome. I remember all those conservative priests that knew as a child in the 1970s. No matter how bad the church got, no matter how worse it got, they never became traditional. Other priests woke up and came back to tradition throughout that time of the of the 70s, 80s, and 90s. But the very conservative ones who became comfortable in their position who decided that they would find their own way to make friends between God and the devil, who would try to, to work in a conservative way inside their parish, and subverting the bishop's commands, and subverting the superior's commands, and operating in not an open manner, in order to secretly bring people to the truth, which is not the duty of the priest. The priest is to bring people openly to the truth. He only operates secretly when he is in a persecuted country, going from house to house because of persecution on the outside. This is not the way he operates with his superior. This is not the way he operates within his own organization. So let's pray for the priests who in our world today are in the process of being tempted very heavily by a false conservatism. And these priests shall become the tools of the devil if they don't repent. And we pray also for those innocent priests, the ones who are not in this kind of temptation, but are only making a mistake in judgment. That the grace of God comes to their souls and gives them the strength to understand that the Society of Pius X is just another noble sort of appendage. That the conservative movement is not the right movement and right way to bring souls back to God. 
and that God gives grace to everyone to be able to be saved. And many of the souls in that movement are good souls. But the movement is harmful to souls. The movement is harmful to God. And the, and the priests must, be, must repent of being inside of that false movement and go back to the way of our fathers and our ancestors, which is Catholic tradition without compromise. And, and, that, and also open and clear with our superiors and our fellow priests and not are trying to operate in a demonic and secretive way. So we'll pray for the priests that are falling for the temptation of a false conservatism which develops in them a deep pride and creates the damnation of many souls. And for the other priests that are weak because they're afraid of losing their place and that they will be given the strength and courage to be able to stand up because God will never abandon those who stand for him. And the third level of priests who are very innocent and who don't care about the loss of their home, the loss of their diocese, but who simply want to do what's right before God and are trapped by a misunderstanding of a false obedience. And if they could only understand the truth, they would quickly follow our Christian Lefebvre, quickly follow those old priests who stood up against the diocese, who very quickly come to the battlefield of the truth and be ready to lay down their lives for God. Their hearts are already the friends of God, but they misunderstand. And they're making mistakes, which the mistakes are causing harm for souls. These priests, we pray for their conversion, which only, only requires an understanding of the mind. The other two priests require a conversion of the heart. And so we'll pray for the conversion of all, and that they come back to God in this great fight for tradition that is going on now, and which can only be ended by the miraculous intervention of heaven. And that will come soon, but between now and then, that stand for the truth and fight for it as our ancestors did openly and clearly and not in a manner of deceit. Closing bless you all, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen.